Tonight, Barnaby Joyce. Should he be sacked for being flat on his back in the street after allegedly mixing pills and alcohol? And why are we funding artists like this man who says we're racist but is meanwhile helping to leak details of 600 Jews who call Zionists even parasites? Also tonight, can US President Joe Biden go on after yet more disastrous memory lapses and fake Aboriginal professor Bruce Pascoe? Is his Aboriginal agriculture business growing seeds for supposedly traditional Aboriginal pancakes and breads running out of steam? There's actually uh, an important point to be made about that. But before I get into the immigration scandal, I, I couldn't believe it. A perfect sign today of Australia's decline. This uh, something-for-nothing culture that we're developing, the culture where this Albanese government is even passing a law that makes an offence for bosses to contact workers at home if the workers don't like being bothered. Would you believe that today two air traffic controllers in Sydney called in sick? And just because of that, thousands of travellers across the country face delays and even cancellations. Arrivals at Sydney Airport cut to 26 per hour, down from the normal 40 or so. Delays of about 72 minutes on average for Qantas, 95 minutes for Virgin. Well, <laughs> I hope these two air traffic controllers really were sick and not just uh, giving themselves a long weekend courtesy of their unlimited sick leave. I'd say that this could happen in a country that used to pride itself on hard work. Well, that was a thing of amazement in Senate hearings today. It's pretty incredible that two people don't show up for work and the entire country is shut down. I um, completely accept that and this is one of the issues that we're working through, that we have an unplanned absence during the day. Honestly, this is something I uh, once expected when I was flying around in Ethiopia or China, but here in Australia today... But to the Albanese government's incredible immigration scandal today, all the murderers and rapists, they let out, without telling us, nearly 150 criminals. Now, it reminds me of an important fact about people, about politicians too. What you don't love, you don't look after, like uh, your country. And I'm thinking of that, about things like this government's attitude to Australia Day, as I wonder how it could possibly have let out from immigration detention over the past four months, no fewer than seven murderers, we thought knew about three, seven murderers, or people who tried to murder, 37 sex offenders, would you believe, including rapists and pedophiles, and 72 people convicted of crimes of violence, bashings, kidnappings, armed robberies, and so on. How could the government have done that without initially taking basic security measures. We talked about that last year. And then, without telling you exactly what was going on, in fact, giving us blather and word salads when they were asked about it last year, giving us anything but an answer. Are they all hardcore criminals and are the remainder of the 340 who may be released mm -hmm. all, or are a lot of them hardcore criminals? Are they murderers? Are they pedophiles? Etc. Let me say again, um, these people are not people who I wanted on the streets of our country and that is exactly why they were kept in detention until our government received a High Court ruling that we must follow, that we must release these people from immigration detention. So let's just be really clear about this. Some of the crimes that have been committed by these people are deplorable and disgusting. And that is why they were being detained by including me by and the, our government. Including until, by the other 250. Up until the point that the High Court told us this was illegal. I'm sick of it. I just, cut, cut, cut. Look, I know the government says it was forced by the High Court to let foreigners out from immigration detention if there was no hope of sending them back home, right? Or if they refused to go. But the High Court did not say, by the way, Albanese government, don't tell voters what kind of criminals you're actually letting loose to roam our streets. The High Court also didn't say, well, and don't tell them today, in Parliament, mind you, how many of those detainees have since been arrested or charged again, 24, no fewer than that, charged with things like breaching their conditions or having drugs or having unauthorised contact with children. Don't say how many of them have been let out 
without wearing ankle bracelets. And I could also didn't say to this government, and don't even tell Australians if even the murderers you've been letting out are walking around without ankle bracelets either. Can the minister confirm the seven murderers and 37 sex offenders released from detention are all wearing ankle bracelets? Give a call to the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship and Multicultural Affairs. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the Shadow Minister for his question. And I can confirm, as I think I've made clear earlier, that the management of everyone in this cohort is determined by the professional men and Order. women of the Order. Community Safety Board. Again and again, that clown, the immigration minister, refused to answer questions, you know, how many have got bracelets, ankle bracelets, how many re wouldn't answer, uh, just passed the buck down to some unelected, uh, unnamed uh, officials somewhere else. Honestly, it gets worse. The government told us last December, oh, we fixed this. It rushed through a new law so that it at least apply to have the worst of these ex-detainees sent back to jail. But since then, the government has asked not for even one of those foreign criminals to be put back in detention. Not one of those seven murderers. Not one of those 37 sex offenders. Not one of the people since charged again. Not a single one of them. And you ask yourself, how could this be? Now, obviously, the you know, obvious answer, the Home Affairs Minister, Andrew Offsider, that immigration minister you saw, Andrew Giles, they're simply incompetent, just incompetent. I mean, last December, I said the Prime Minister should sack Andrew Giles. Uh, I bet he now will, but next December at the latest. But is there something else that explains this unbelievable behaviour? And again, I ask, does this Albanese government love this country? Now, I'm sorry if the question sounds... Uh, Offensive. I mean, they're going to say, of course we do, of course we love this country. How dare you ask that? But how often have you heard a federal Labor politician not just say, of course I love it, but actually tell you why and all the wonderful things about this country they love? Have you ever heard them say such things? Oh, wonderful country on Australia Day, for instance, listing all the virtues and none of the supposed sins. How many of you heard say that? Now, Claire O'Neill, that Home Affairs Minister, yeah, she said uh, this year, oh, she loved going to the uh, citizenship ceremonies on Australia Day. But that's the only thing I heard from her about loving Australia, loving to preserve Australia. And don't forget, this is a government that's actually led in a record 81, let a record 81 councils this year, not mark Australia Day with their own citizenship ceremonies because they're so ashamed of our past. And while I can't recall a single minister singing Australia's praises on Australia Day, telling us what's so good about this culture and our traditions, I did hear O'Neill last weekend celebrate the culture of China instead for the Lunar New Year. Happy Lunar New Year, everyone, and welcome to the Year of the Dragon. This is going to be such a special year for our country, a year of nobility, of achievement, of luck, and I'm so excited to share that with you. Um, I'm here in Springvale in the heart of my beautiful multicultural electorate of Hotham. Uh, one of the most important and beautiful things about our great country is the way that different people from different cultures around the world so generously and willingly share their cultural traditions with other Australians. So I say to all of you, uh, this Lunar New Year has become a central part of celebration for our calendar. Happy New Year to all of you and let's celebrate together the Year of the Dragon. Have you heard one Labor Minister of this government gush about Australia at the length and with the warmth like that minister in charge of Home Affairs and Immigration gushed about the Chinese New Year? Now, the shame that we uh, preached of this Australian culture is pretty. We now, you know, of course, the Captain Cook statue in Melbourne that was cut off at the ankles in the night before Australia Day, but even in the country town of Alexandra, the statue of Queen Alexandra was last week beheaded after being there for nearly 85 years. And I'm now wondering, if a government ashamed of Australia's past and in raptures about every culture but our own, 
would actually treat our immigration system as something that exists for the benefit of Australians or for the benefit of foreigners. Now, it's, again, offensive, but it's worth asking because check the record, this immigration scandal, the criminals let loose, our ridiculous and reckless immigration intake, 500,000 plus new immigrants net in one year. Or the government increasing our refugee intake now to 20,000 a year. Focusing on bringing in people from war-torn tribal areas who are likely to struggle to adapt the Middle East, Africa and Asia. Or the decision last year to bring in 860 so-called Palestinian refugees from Gaza and the West Bank, areas run by terrorists without any type of proper security checks. Is that in our benefit or theirs? How could you do all that if you were passionate about this country its culture, its safety. And why is it always Labor that seems to lose control of our borders? Like maybe they don't really care quite enough. Now, I don't think, uh, really, that incompetence explains everything about today's scandal. Love for Australia? Is that missing as well? Joining me now is former Victorian Liberal Party President Michael Croker and former Labor Senator Stephen Conroy. Stephen, uh, I think I sensed, I heard a little seething to my right. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, look, Andrew, I mean, you did apologise in advance for if you offended anyone and you offended me. I know the overwhelming... Uh, this government. ..members of this government... And for you to question their love for this country, I do find offensive. When did I know you last hear Tell me when you When did you I last hear Peter Dutton? When did I last hear any... If that, the, the test you when said you last is completely false. And a love of this country is agreeing to the rule of law. So when the High Court says the legislation passed by the Liberal Party is so flawed, we're saying you've got to let these people go you follow the rule of law. It didn't say let these okay. people go you without proper constraints, the without telling the public what to do, law. without telling the Whether public you, they included well, seven murders. So for you to just whitewash yeah, the yeah. fact that Peter Dutton was in charge when he was not able to pass legislation that complied with the High Court, even when lots of people said it didn't, OK? Even when... So don't... don't don't sit here, Mate, Andrew, and say, I have made crystal clear and say it's Labor the lost control of the borders. The, the process is called snowing Parliament public. and passing legislation that won't so Andrew, fail the High Court test. So That's Andrew, called process. Yeah, and well, Stephen, the answer is this. Only one of those people had to be let out. The High Court case related oh, to one seriously. person only because the evidence before... So you want the, to pay the money as well? The evidence before the High Court was that there was only them. one person who the department said couldn't realistically Michael, be you're a lawyer. Uh, you I am a lawyer and rubbish. you are not. So can I this tell is you, rubbish. If they you panicked choose to or they pay panicked one case and they ignore panicked. its implications across Your the government rest. panicked and you let out 151 be, people when they shouldn't have. To no, sue the government well, and don't be, compensation. don't be so intimidated, right? They only needed to let out one. And by the way, by the way, let, uh, it's wonderful to see Claire O'Neill there celebrate Chinese New Year, and that's a wonderful thing. Let's see if O'Neill and Giles and all those other Labor ministers... Uh, are celebrating Jewish New Year in October, Andrew, as, as, as a wonderful part of the Australian multicultural community because their performance on Israel has been disgusting. I would have loved to... Look, my point is, these people are not celebrating Australia and I don't know... It's, I saw this when I was well, flying around. Well, sorry, sorry, but Labor but I do. Decisions. I know these West. people and I know they love this country. years ago, they may say they do, they do not give speeches that they do, and it seems that even from the time that I was working for Labor, following Immigration Minister Stuart West around Darwin, who was handing out cash to various ethnic groups, I thought the immigration program existed for people like him as a way to draft in people to Australia that they could have vote a little and harvesting you're, exercises. You're starting, you're starting to sound like Donald Trump here now, Andrew, and I know that. Mate, I, know I that was is with something... Labor, I saw it, and I was appalled by mm, what I'm I saw. Afraid. That, that's, a, that's a Donald Trump-style market conspiracy theory. Oh, oh, secretly oh, secretly oh, bringing say. these groups in because oh, they vote Labor. Oh, my goodness. Not being, mate, you have... You, oh, my goodness. Your faction has trawled in all those ethnic groups for factional... And so is Michael's. ...votes. Don't tell me that it's not... That was Michael. Don't, don't profess shock. Shock. I don't profess shock. Thing. I'm just saying the Liberals are guilty yeah, of everything. Yeah. I'll say you both do it. Oh, that's going to make me feel really better. I mean, mm. seriously. Mm. But listen, um, can Andrew Giles survive as uh, minister? 
Well, he shouldn't, but of course he will. I mean, if you if you accuse someone of incompetence, uh, that's a bad thing. If but if you the, sack someone because of incompetence, the high court ruling, it's better he didn't. No, it, it, that, that's the point. Can we just divorce the High Court ruling? <laughs> yes, something had to be done. The manner of doing it. His manner of doing it has been appalling. appalling. And he will be sacked for there's it. No point, have to there's no why. point admitting his incompetence by convicting him, by sacking him. Once you sack him, you admit that they stuffed the whole thing up. As long as he's out there batting this way, things away like a night watchman in the parliament, uh, Albo can, can, you know, bat the thing away. Like Stephen tonight, oh, well, it's only, you know, they had to follow the High Court. It's not Giles. It's not O'Neill. We have to follow the High Court. It's Peter Dutton's so, legislation. Oh, right. He was told it was okay. flawed. We've heard that. He was told it was flawed all, when he moved. It's all Peter Dutton's fault. It's all Listen, Peter Dutton's. Uh, it is. Yeah. I'm he, glad you let, acted he let them, prepared. He let them all out. out. He let the murderers and rapists. Oh, yeah. and, he, passed well, he let them all out. That allowed them. Your ministers panicked, if Stephen. That's fault, what happened. They released under a Labor government <laughs> in this manner. But listen. Um, here's a little thing for you, free kick. Barnaby Joyce, right? Um, the na his caused the Nationals a bit of embarrassment. One of the front benches, Barnaby, as you know, former Prime, uh, Vice, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, filmed lying on his back in the street, swearing during a call to his wife. There's no... There's now hints that he's uh, dealing with something personal. We don't know. His father-in-law says so. But all that he will say is that he mixed medications and alcohol. Here he is. I'm on a prescription... Uh, drug and they say certain things may happen to you if you drink and they were absolutely 100% right, they did. I, I'm not looking for sympathy and I'm not looking for an excuse, I'll just stand by that. What I, what I said is what I said, I came back, um, I sat on a planter box, I fell off and I was videotaped, there you go. Now, no one uh, in the opposition today, including the Nationals leader, David Littleproud, seem to be laughing it off and guaranteeing uh, Barnaby Joyce's job, should they? Look, uh, in my time uh, in the Parliament when Barnaby uh, was also there, he had a number of medical incidents. I I'm not in a situation where I can say what the medication is. I know he has been unhealthy in the past. Uh, I think then don't you know, drink. there's time. If you can't, oh, the drugs are there, don't you? You warned. I, I'm, I, no. <laughs> you know, I'm a teetotal, Andrew, so I'm, I'm not the best person to pass judgment on this because I've never drunk when I've been on medication. Uh, but the advice is pretty clear. The medications that can be impacted by alcohol say it in a very straightforward way. I don't know if there is, as you've suggested, a hint that there's another issue that's at stake here. I don't know. But, I mean, whether Barnum should be on the front bench, well, I think that's a question that Little Proud and Dutton should both have a conversation. Except, of course, you know that Little Proud and, and Barnaby Joyce mm. are vying for who should be top dog. Well, I don't think they are anymore. Little Proud's done a very good job. <laughs> he was terrific. I think he's one of their better performers. A Little Proud, I'll give him his credit. I don't, I don't know, David, but on The Voice... He was the first out, and I give him great credit for having the courage. Everyone in the weeks after were bagging the National Party, saying, oh, he's out on a limb, he's too right-wing, whatever. Good on you, David. And you he did, did it you did without it. getting in people's it, face. Exactly. He did exactly the right thing. Uh, uh, Joyce is not a serious competitor now against Little Proud. Uh, obviously, Barnaby shouldn't have done what he's done. But, uh, uh, you know, like Stephen, I'm a teetotaler, uh, mainly. But, uh, um, um, but, uh, but, but there, are, there are members of Parliament who've done worse things in recent days than, than that. And I'm talking about some of your ministers who've a lot, done a lot more damage to the country than Barnaby Joyce has done to himself or the country, Stephen. Oh, right. Now, look, uh, Opposition Leader Peter Dutton today, uh, over the weekend, said um, he is going to wind back some of the industrial relations changes by, made by the government. Uh, particularly, it seems, this, you know, right to disconnect thing, which... The Labor Party cooked up with the Greens. The Greens pushed it so that a boss faces, I think, criminal sanctions if he rings an employer, employee at home and the employee takes offence and doesn't want it and takes action. I mean, for heaven's sake, is Peter Dutton right to say this is going too far? Well, I'm not sure criminal sanctions is the right place. I, I suspect there's been, uh, unfortunately, a drafting error. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to see anyone jailed for phoning... You know, no, but even so, to work I mean, out. But on the principle, but on the principle, like, in the day before mobile phones were invented and the internet mm. was as pervasive as it is, none of us got phone calls or emails from our bosses. The world was a perfectly reasonable place. Well, look, 
You know, I, I, I worry about Gary Gray, but uh, if he, didn't, if he <laughs> wouldn't leave you alone, then, then I, I can't be held responsible for Gary Gray's behaviour. Hello, Gary. But, uh, I, think the answer, think? I think the answer is, Andrew, that the employer... Is he leading with his chin, though? He is a bit, because the employer organisations, unfortunately, have no influence whatsoever in Canberra. No one listens to a word they say. No one listens to a word big business says. I've never seen them weaker or with less influence, and, and we all know why, because of the wokeism. So Labor are driving a huge truck right through the employer organisations, and I don't blame them for doing so, because never has their opposition, i.e. the employer organisations and big business, been so Hello, without Innes. any influence <laughs> whatsoever. Locks. No one listens to them. So should Peter die on a hill over something like this? No, he shouldn't. Not every issue is his issue. Andrew? Look, it's tough. It's tough. You're fighting without... Back when you were Peter Costello and Fred Staunder and all those and others. And the great Ian McLaughlin, Morgan. Hugh. Boy, oh boy. Mudgeonbury, yeah. Uh, Michael Craig, Stephen Conroy, thank you Thanks, both for your time. After the break, a brawl between our Defence Chiefs and the Albanese Government with the head of the Navy even gag. How much trouble are we in? Plus, Joe Biden shows it's now impossible for him to stay president, I'm afraid, and fake Aboriginal Bruce Pascoe. Have Australians finally stopped buying what he's selling? Now, something weird is going on with our Defence Department and the ministers in the Albanese government. And just when uh, we've got three wars now involving the West and China threatening another. Last Friday, one of these uh, ministers, Defence Industries Minister Pat Conroy banned the, even banned the Chief of Air Force, Rob Chipman, from answering journalists' questions about the arguments that have been reported between these two Labor ministers, Defence Ministers as well, and the heads of our armed forces. Joining me is the country's top foreign affairs writer, Greg Sheridan, the Australian newspaper. Greg, um, what's going on? How serious is this? Well, <clears throat> everything Miles says and thinks about the defence establishment is true, and everything they think and say about Miles is true. They are both responsible for the absolute debacle of Australian defence policy. Def the defence establishment thinks Miles hasn't got them any new money, which is absolutely true, and has given them a whole lot of new tasks. That's right. Miles thinks the defence establishment hasn't woken up to the strategic situation we're living in and is still trying to safeguard all its legacy programs, is disregarding the defence strategic review. That's true as well. Neither of them is producing a powerful... Australian Defence Force with independent strategic weight and independent deterrent capability, and they are both as bad as each other. Mind you, a final note, when Miles came into office, he reappointed all the existing defence leaders and said, it's been a debacle the last 10 years, but that's been entirely the fault of the coalition ministers. The Defence Department is completely blameless. <laughs> Nearly two years into the Albanese government, his line is the exact <laughs> reverse. <laughs> It's entirely the defence, the fault of the defence establishment and the government is blameless. What a difference being in office makes. The way you put it, though, uh, if I had to choose, it'd probably be more on Miles' side of that argument. But still, yeah, what a shame that he's got no weight in Cabinet and can't get money because, boy, do we need a little boost there. Um, next week uh, is the next step in this process. Yet another review being handed to the government, this time in our Navy, essentially. Um, it's been done by a retired American admiral. What do you expect from it? Well, I expect nothing in the next 10 years. Uh, I expect oh. grandiloquent language. So Miles is completely culpable himself. I, I don't think he gets any virtue in this argument with the Defence Department because he's given no leadership, absolutely no leadership. Um, the government has had this review since last September. So remember, the defence strategic review was meant to be short and sharp, down and dirty, quick. We're going to, we're not going to do a white paper because it takes so long. Then out of that, we got 15 new reviews. One of which was this surface fleet review that was going to be down and dirty, quick before Geelong won the grand final. Remember all that? They did give it to him before the AFL grand final, and he sat on it and done nothing. Now I think we're going to confirm the continuation of the Hunter frigates, which are. Frigates that weigh 10,000 tonnes, whereas our destroyers weigh 7,000 tonnes. We've put our own radar, our own combat system on them. So they're overweight, undermanned. They only have 32 vertical launch cells compared to modern destroyers, which have 96, which means they can't carry the missiles to defend themselves or hurt an enemy. We're not going to scrap that. We're not going to do anything in the next 10 years. We'll fiddle around with the offshore patrol vessels. But the government has been in office nearly two years 
and so far nothing has happened. There will be eye watering. Oh, hello. What about all these brilliant papers that they've got on the desk? Absolutely. There will be there will be eye watering sums of money in this statement all in ten years' time. Nothing inside forward estimates of four years. When you years. can absolutely guarantee that Albanese won't be Prime Minister yeah. and uh, Richard Miles won't be Defence Minister. Absolutely. Someone else's can. That's right. Um, President Joe Biden's had an absolute shocker, hasn't he? Last, I don't know whether you saw the yeah, did, press yeah, conference on yeah. Friday. What appalling. He's got a report by a secret, uh, special counsel uh, appointed by his own administration, looked into him keeping these documents in his shed when he uh, shouldn't have. Uh, concluded that he had kept them unlawfully, kept top secret uh, documents, uh, but it shouldn't be prosecuted because, honestly, uh, the jury would see that Joe Biden was a well-meaning elderly man who just had a terrible memory. In fact, the report said couldn't even remember when his son died within several years. Actually, it was 2015. Couldn't remember. Couldn't remember when he'd been vice president. And at the press conference afterwards, Biden, just to confirm it, confused the president of Mexico with the president of Egypt. Initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. How serious is this for Biden? I think it's uh, all over Red Rover. Uh, I, look, I think it's very serious, Andrew. I, I don't think it's terminal yet because these are the two worst candidates the US has ever had. Donald Trump has just declared he would encourage Russia to attack NATO members. Had encouraged, yeah. Yeah, if, if they didn't pay yeah. their dues to NATO. And, of course, nobody pays money to NATO. They pay their own defence budgets. I mean... Trump's statements are as irrational as Biden's, but they're irrational in a more rational way. He's deliberately irrational. This is a terrible contest, the demented against the deranged. You know, uh, one no, of them is too I'm old and one of them is too crazy. Complaining that we're too anti-Trump again. Yeah. But look, I, I thought his statement on NATO was, was terrible because the, the principle of NATO, what makes it such an effective deterrent, is, a, is the pledge. You attacked one of us you attack us all. And for Donald Trump, he was quite right to say NATO countries are not pulling their weight and they have been. It's a disgrace. But to actually say that, you know... That he had attacked Russia. Now, it's true his supporters say you take him seriously but not literally and he didn't act on that when he was in office, all of that. But still, it was a terrible thing to say. But nor do I want to run away from criticism of Biden. Biden is plainly mentally incompetent and cannot... Mind you... In many respects, Biden is the best of the Democrats because he remembers politics from the 1980s when it was better than now and he wasn't educated at Harvard, so he doesn't favour Islamist terrorists over a liberal democracy. <laughs> you know, but, but what, a, what a world we're in. And the final point, but the most important one I'd make, Andrew, in this world where we've got presidential candidates like that, Congress holding up $60 billion of aid to Ukraine and Israel, wouldn't you think an Australian government would want to make sure we had as much independent deterrent capability as we could possibly have? Without a doubt. In fact, I'll raise up this a cracker later in the uh, year because uh, Britain's defence uh, travels seem to be almost uh, as bad. Greg Sheridan, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Don't be depressed. I know things are serious, but... After the break, why are arts bureaucrats... Oh, even more serious. Are giving grants to artists who hate this country, hate America, hate Israel, and are now outing Jews they don't like. Why are we giving them our money? And fake Aborigine Bruce Pascoe. Have Australians finally stopped buying what he's selling? <laughs> Professor Bruce Pascoe fascinates me, as does his latest trouble. As you know, I've shown that his claims to be Aborigine, uh, an Aborigine are fake. Uh, but it's astonishing that people looking at his ruddy cheeks still don't suspect that themselves or don't let them suspect that his bestseller, Dark Emu, also essentially fake history, claiming Aborigines before white settlement weren't hunter-gatherers at all. But farmers, really. In fact, farmers living in houses in towns of a 1,000 people, of which, as you know, no evidence exists, and yet it's believed. It's taught in schools, promoted by the ABC, and even today in polite society, it is racist and rude to doubt Bruce Pascoe. That's fascinating to me. But there's also something very interesting happening at his farm near Malakuta, where his plan was to grow again. These crops he thought Aborigines were farming and to sell the seeds that he would produce. He even appeared in a cooking show with a very gullible eye to Buttrose, later chairman of the ABC, cooking Aboriginal pancakes with Aboriginal grain. Not looking that appetising, really, once it was in the pan. 
But anyway, but there's now an update. And joining me is Tony Thomas, who's an author, journalist and writer on Quadrant Online, where he's written two columns now on Pascoe's legacy. Tony Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. Look, the elites haven't given up on, on Bruce Pascoe, right? For all intents and purposes, he's still their favourite Aboriginal, even the, the Aborigine, even though he's got no uh, Aboriginal ancestry. But <laughs> sure. he's, one of his two, he's, he's on the board of two, very, two uh, organisations. One is Twofold Aboriginal Corporation and the other is Black Duck Foods, which... Uh, picks up the costs of his farm near Malakuta. I'm not so sure yes. if that's going as well as he would have hoped. Well, you won't believe this, uh, Andrew, but the Black Duck Foods, uh, which he set up as a charity to re relieve him of all costs and problems with his farm, it's all run through the charity, uh, has creamed in $2.2 million in grants and donations for the past four years, and it's burned through almost the whole of that, and it's only got $200,000 left of that money, that free money, and within uh, six months, I'd say, all that will be gone because it's losing money at the rate of about a quarter of a million a year. Yeah, but, Tony, uh, this surprises me, of course, because we saw... Uh, a lot of media organisations, including the ABC, including Channel 10, promoting the seeds, the native seeds that came from his farm. He was going to <laughs> show that Aborigines really used to be farmers, despite every history book uh, basically telling you they weren't. And uh, they cooked the, the world's first bakers of bread, and he was going to bring the seeds back into <laughs> fashion. What happened? Well, um, his, his actual sales from the farm in the four years have only been about $40,000. So that's not much of a return on $2 million that they've spent. And in the last year, the total farm output was about 14000 and the costs were about $40,000. So, in effect, it's, it's entirely a token uh, sales exercise and he makes a little bit of money from uh, uh, tourist stays there at $800 a night per person and... $500 for welcomes to country and and uh, things like that. Well, it turns out, of course, that the native seeds do not have anything near the return per acre, in, you know, in terms of calories that you would want to sustain a population. Guess what? Uh, it seems that Western Ways did turn out to be the best after all. But for all this, Tony, we can laugh, we can snicker and all that kind of stuff. We can have the schadenfreude, but... Basically, his influence lives on in our museums. Explain to me what you saw when you went to a museum in Adelaide. I went to the Discovery uh, Centre in Glenelg, a little bit out of town, because it was a wet day and we were wondering what to do. And there we found uh, an exhibit which uh, went like this, that, that uh, at the time of invasion, Aboriginal people across the continent had homes, they farmed the land, they cared for crops, and they were advancing with technologies. Now, this is, was unattributed. It's by the corner nation, this exhibition. But uh, it's straight out of Dark Emu, and and it's it's just so ridiculous. But all the same, that uh, display centre won the most uh, highest prize of the Galleries and Museums Association in 2020. So that's how this stuff gets uh, swallowed. It's it's just unbelievable. It's extraordinary. I don't know how often we've gone through you, me. Uh others as well, uh, Peter Kelly, uh, uh, so many anthropologists, that Bruce Pascoe's history in Dark Emu, bestseller taught in schools, is actually actually largely bogus, that uh, he talks about towns of up to a 1,000 uh, Aborigines. There weren't any such ones. He doesn't have the evidence for them. He cites... Uh, uh, passages that don't exist and he said they were farmers when in fact they were hunter-gatherers but yet this thing gets a prize from this museum thing uh, uh, you know association representing all museums but that uh, association seems to be on a mission to spread this false gospel doesn't it 
Yeah, well, it's a huge thing. It was only when I began uh, looking behind the curtain on the uh, on the website that you began to see how. Uh, all encompassing this drive by the museums and galleries to uh, indoctrinate everybody to the total black armband vision of history. In 2019, they embarked on a 10-year plan to turn every museum, every gallery, uh, to the best of their ability, every school, TAFE, university, local, state and federal governments, and, and the, what they call the whole cultural centre, into this black armband waving school of of history and also it's full of all this ludicrous woke stuff there was one curator who said museums need to be repairing the harm done by white supremacy colonialism patriarchy heteronormativity don't ask me what that is mm. ableism and capitalism <laughs> So, so that's the agenda. It's it's the total left thing, and thank heavens the uh, referendum failed because if it had have succeeded, all this stuff would now be galloping through the the system. And in addition, they want uh, to push this line that the Aborigines were big on advanced technology. So apart from all the what they want about past injustices and dark histories, they want to have museums showcasing Aboriginal science and technology. And this even includes science museums that are now meant, according to this Galleries Association, to flavour all their science stuff with Aboriginality. Tony Thomas, uh, thank you so much for your time. If people want to read more of this because your essays have been fabulous, they should go to Quadrant Online and uh, look up your name. Uh, brilliant stuff. Thank you so much. The saddest thing about the latest example of people whipping up Jew haters here is that our arts bureaucrats are actually funding two of the people doing it. Matt Chun, who does watercolours for children's books, and feminist Clementine Ford, angry feminists, have helped to circulate on social media the names of 600 Jews they claim are secretly trying to silence critics of Israel. Now, already some of those Jews have been threatened, uh, moved house uh, for fear. That's already sick enough. Worst is that our arts bureaucracies have given both Chun and Ford tens of thousands of dollars of your money to keep them in business. They're funding enemies of our civilization with little talent and much hate. Now, Chun, for instance, also makes money by selling pictures of a burning police car. He claims so-called Zionists is outing are parasitic upon progressive spaces and says Zionists are thoroughly racist and thoroughly anti-Indigenous. On October 7, the day that Hamas terrorists started this war with Israel by slaughtering 1,200 Jews, raping women, kidnapping 250-odd people, Chun tweeted this apparent defence. Power to the freedom fighters. Death to the occupation. Resistance by any means necessary. What does any means necessary mean? But he doesn't just hate Israel. On the taxpayer-funded uh, liminal site, it is claimed... White supremacy remains at the core of the Australian state. He's also tweeted that the Albanese government is a violent colonial regime, the Liberal voters are racist dogs, and the US the greatest threat to peace. It's amazing. Yet Creative Australia, our top funding body, last year gave Chun $42,000. Victoria State Library made him its Children's Literature Fellow. Create New South Wales gave him a share of $187,000, a government grant there. And the state-funded 4A Centre for Contemporary Asian Art named him its emerging writer. Writers Victoria last year even gave Chun money to do a children's book about the supposed enslavement of Pacific Islanders in colonial Australia. I mean, seriously, what our our arts bureaucrats funding with our money and when will the arts ministers in this country say stop joining me is the panel liberal mp garth hamilton and stephen chavura author and senior lecturer in history at campion college you know steve we always get these arguments don't we you know uh well you can't interfere with freedom of speech and all the, uh, and particularly the arts you can't second guess the artists and make but seriously why should i pay artists like this and let them earn their own crust and see how far they get then with this hate. Well, you shouldn't pay and, and you certainly shouldn't pay an artist who's borderline uh, 
calling for, for violence with, with that tweet, you know, resistance by any means necessary. That is almost an explicit call for violence. And to, 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 to tweet such sickening sentiments immediately after that attack on Israel, it just shows that there is simply, there is simply no moral compass um, in this particular case. And the, 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 here's the ironic thing, though. I mean, these artists often sort of fancy themselves very brave and social justice warriors. And so naturally, their object of criticism is countries like Australia and the US and Britain that are free, that are tolerant, that take in, over time, millions of immigrants who wind up living very well here, as opposed to countries like China, which imprisons hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, merely for speaking out against the regime, or countries like Saudi Arabia, even even Palestinian territories which have no respect for liberal democratic rights uh, that they themselves uh, claim to support. Uh, but of course, all the while, these so-called bold artists are happy to hold their nose and take filthy colonial money, which of course they should not be getting by their own principles because that money is apparently tainted. Our irony of ironies, Matt Trun is actually given money by the Jewish-funded uh, Maya Foundation, Jewish-run, uh, and uh, part of a program in the name of a Jewish author. He took that money, all right. Um, but Garth Hamilton, is there a better way of funding? Well, I think there's certainly a better question we should be asking before distributing that funding, and is that, are these artists or are they activists? And I think you can differentiate quite clearly between the two. And some of the examples that you've given, Andrew, are clearly examples of people profiting from the extreme misery of very, very vulnerable people. Uh, so, look, I, I don't think that society has great tolerance for this. And you're right to raise it. This isn't a question of freedom of speech. This isn't a question of artistic licence and allowing people to express themselves. This is about community standards. And I think government does have a role in that. We shouldn't just be handing out money willy-nilly because it's being applied for. I think we can ask, what is the purpose of this and does it benefit our society? Does it benefit our society? We should have, have to have ministers that are prepared to uh, make the uh, ruling on that, but increasingly they're, they're, they're uh, divesting their responsibility to unaccountable arts bodies uh, who seem to be made of same-same thinkers. I mean, talk about rugged individuals, they all seem to think alike, which is weird. Um, but can I just say with you, Garth, because you're upset that the NAB Bank uh, is closing dozens of branches because customers are switching to online. Why does this upset you? I mean, uh, isn't that market forces? Look, uh, there's a lot about the NAB that upsets me. This was a bank that made a lot of noise during the voice campaign about how important it was to listen to regional voices, uh, except when it comes to things that they can control. Uh, so they're quite happy to close down regional branches. I don't know how they're going to be listening to regional voices if they're closing down those branches. It goes further, the hypocrisy... Uh, the Pittsworth branch, which is in my electorate and has got me most excited about this, there's a sign on the wall that says, we think locally. Um, look, I, I <laughs> can't see a greater case of hypocrisy. This is just pure marketing by the NAB. They don't think locally. They don't think about Pittsworth. This is a town uh, surrounded by great black soil. It's a wonderful regional community. If you can't run a bank there in a town like that, you can't run one anywhere outside of a city. So I think NAB, for a start, needs to be honest that they have no intention of running regional banks. Uh, but look, beyond this, Andrew, I think there's a bigger question. And I think it's time for us to have this conversation. The big four banks exist within a policy framework that the Australian government, successive Australian governments, have created. And if they are unable to sustain branches in places like Pittsworth, maybe it's time we looked at different policy settings that helped the customer-owned banks, uh, the smaller banks, provide more competition. Yeah. I'll be pushing for that. I think, it's, I think this time of uh, the big four dominating right. has to come to an end. But Stephen, but Stephen, you know, the market forces the market forces. They can't make it work if it's cheaper, you know, they, they don't want to inconvenience other customers. Uh, maybe that's the price they pay, the uh, lack of local community. Uh, yeah, but that's a very, very heavy price. I mean, literally not being able to get to a bank in your community. And uh, I tend to agree that uh, this is actually a tremendous market opportunity uh, for smaller banks to come in. And so I would actually suggest that smaller banks uh, should really take advantage of this, um, not just as something that's good for the community, but as a, as a genuine way of getting into uh, that market. Yeah, well, maybe. I know I love my local post office in the next town. Uh, great stuff. I love that personal touch. Garth Hamilton, Stephen Trevura, thank you both so much for your time.
After the break, the king is seen in church as he starts his cancer treatment and black racism against whites now preach at university, an extraordinary example. You know, we like to think, uh, oh, Britain's one of the powers that'll help us out if our own underfunded, undergun military gets outnumbered. But I tell you what, it's hard. It's had to call off sending one of its aircraft carriers to the biggest NATO military, military ex exercises in years because not one, but two of those aircraft carriers have technical troubles. And now Britain's Defence Secretary is saying, well, I'm going to get really serious here. I'm going to get rid of woke nonsense like uh, relaxing security checks for overseas recruits to hire more black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, servicemen. <laughs> Seriously. Joining me from London is writer, broadcaster and author Esther Kraku. Esther, thanks for your time. It, it's incredible that two aircraft carriers you can't use. And then in the middle of that, your Defence Secretary says, well, we've got to start having a war on, on, on woke in our own military. What a mess. Yep, clearly our Ministry of Defence has their priorities uh, mixed up. At the end of the day, the question is, do we have confidence that our defence can actually defend this country, which is their, their primary duty? I mean, since the 1980s, yeah. the amount we spend on, on defence has halved. I mean, to put it into perspective, we spent more on servicing our debt last year than we spent on the police and the defence combined. Uh, so clearly there's an issue of, of just pure funding. I mean, in the last 10 years alone, you know, uh, staffing levels in, in the army has gone down by 14%. And you would think that recruitment is something that the, the Ministry of Defence is concerned with. But oh no, oh no, because two years ago, the RAF had to actually pay out compensation of £5,000 to 31 white male applicants because apparently they were discriminating against them because they were more interested in uh, not the qualifications of, of the applicants, but they actually the skin colour. Um, so they had to actually pay out compensation because uh, a bunch of emails were leaked and they said that they didn't want a bunch of useless white male pilots. So for that reason, they actually had to pay out money. I, uh, and, and you really have to question whether, you know, these people are actually serious about defending this country. Honestly, what do you... Oh, golly, gosh. It's a sickness in the West. I don't know what's going on, Esther. I'll tell you what, I'll give you another example that really made me sit up. I mean, here's an academic, Dante White, in America, giving a lecture on whiteness last week to the University of California, San Francisco. Listen to this. Whites are psychopaths, and their behavior represents an underlying biologically transmitted proclivity with roots deep in their evolutionary history. Rape culture in America is a legal, economic, and moral institution. So we're going to, we have it written in the law, you can rape black women. I think whites are psychopathic. Esther, yeah, so there's so much more of that stuff. What on earth is going on preached at some of these universities? Yeah, so this man uh, who claims to be a learned academic, uh, he went to the University of California in San Francisco to give this speech about about the, 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 the evilness of whiteness. Now, this man is clearly just deluded and hateful. And you would think that he would be ushered to the fringes of society. But no, 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 no. This man is head of culture and ethics and, and employee experience at the San Francisco uh, Department of Transport <laughs> or the transport agency there. So he's not only he's not only in society, he's front and center. Uh, of, of, of major organizations in the US. I mean, the thing that shocks me the most is he can get away with saying such disparaging comments, and people in general can get away with saying such disparaging comments against white people. But you would never go to Korea and say, oh, the, the, the evilness of, of Asian-ness, there are too many Asians here. I mean, there was a, a news story that leaked here in the UK that apparently the countryside is, is racist, right? You can say that because there are too many white people in a northern European country. Uh, I imagine they wouldn't go to India and say there are too many brown people here, but apparently it's, it's it's fair game when it comes to white people. It's astonishing stuff. You wonder when someone's finally going to pull the chain on that toilet. I, I don't know. Uh, the king was out and about, uh, Esther, after his cancer diagnosis, uh, went to church. How much more do we know now? Because he did seem a bit ginger in this uh, outing. 
Yeah, so we, we don't know, we still don't know the king's um, exact diagnosis, but we know that he's in good spirits. He was, you know, in church um, this, this Sunday um, in his estate in Sandringham. So he is healthy. He seems to be getting on. He seems to be very good spirits. I mean, he, he looks better than I would if, if I got diagnosed with cancer. He's very smiley and happy and cheery. <laughs> um, and that lifts the public spirits because at least we were hopeful that things are going well. We still obviously don't know the exact diagnosis, but I suspect it's, it's probably uh, treatable. Well, uh, we uh, all wish the best and, and all that. Uh, Esther Kraku, lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much indeed for your time. Well, that's it from me. Coming up next is Sherry Markson with a bombshell. Please keep watching, but that from me, it's good night.